The next Cold War has already begun. It's a bomb, duck and cover. At its peak, the Soviet Union was a superpower that could challenge the US for dominance on a global scale. With the world's largest military and the world's second largest economy. Tear down this wall. But with the collapse of the Berlin Wall back in 1989, many believed that the USSR's days were numbered. It no longer exists, but take her for a test drive and you like Today though, answer. Russia, led by Vladimir Putin, has been slowly marching itself back towards its Soviet roots. The invasion of Ukraine in 2022 was, I think we could say, the fundamental starting point symbolically of a new Cold War. Although in reality, it stretches back to at the very least Crimea in 2014. What's disheartening about this war though, is it seems to be the bookend at the end of what has been the most peaceful time in human history, starting, well, at least symbolically with the Berlin Wall falling way back in 1989, the year that I was born. And it seems like, just like post-World War II, this Cold War has kicked off kind of unbeknownst to us, and it still doesn't quite feel like we're in one. But all the markers of a Cold War are there. We've got standoffs and threats of escalation between the US, the EU and Russia. And we've got, most importantly, a very intense proxy war happening with Ukraine stuck right in the middle. These are the markers of what made the Cold War a Cold War. And like I said, back during World War II, this didn't just happen instantly. There were things like the Iron Curtain speech in 1946, leading up to things like the Berlin blockade in the late 40s. But it wasn't until the 50s that everyone realized this was a proper Cold War, although the term had been coined in the 40s. The big question for me though has been simple. How did we get here? And to understand that, we need to really understand what the USSR became at its peak, how it collapsed, and we also need to understand the man behind giving the final blow to democracy and capitalism in Russia. The Soviet Union's beginnings can be traced back to the Russian Revolution of 1917, which led to the rise of the Communist Party and eventual formation of the USSR in 1922. The revolution was fueled by widespread discontent with the autocratic rule of Tsar Nicholas II and Russia's involvement in World War I. Under leaders such as Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union grew to become a global superpower marked by rapid industrialization, a powerful military and an ideological battle against communism. In the early years of the Soviet Union, Lenin implemented the new economic policy, which allowed for some private enterprise in agriculture and small-scale industry, while the state maintained control over larger enterprises. This policy laid the groundwork for the USSR's economic development. However, under Stalin's rule, the Soviet Union shifted towards a centrally planned economy, with the state controlling all aspects of production and distribution. Stalin's policies led to the rapid industrialization and collectivization of agriculture, but at a tremendous cost to human life, including millions of deaths, thanks to famine and political repression. But it was during the Cold War that we saw the USSR at its peak, pushed on by the fact that it was in an intense rivalry with the United States. The arms race, the space race, and various proxy wars define this period. With the threat of nuclear war looming large, the USSR's influence expanded across Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America as it sought to promote communism and counter US influence. The Soviet Union created the Eastern Bloc, a group of socialist countries in Eastern Europe, and established the Warsaw Pact, a military alliance to counter NATO. Key events during the Cold War include the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world came so close to a nuclear conflict, and of course the space race, with the USSR launching the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, and sending the first human, Yugi Gagarin, to space. The Soviet Union also engaged in proxy wars such as the Korean and the Vietnam War to support communist movements and primarily to just counter the US's influence, which was growing across the world as capitalism spread quicker than COVID. However, the Soviet Union's collapse became imminent. 
Economic stagnation and political unrest culminated in the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which symbolized the end of the USSR. Mikhail Gorbachev, who became the General Secretary of the Communist Party in 1985, introduced a series of reforms aimed at reviving the Soviet economy and liberating the political system. His policies included Glasnost, which is the Russian for openness, and Perestroika, or restructuring, contributed to the unraveling of the Soviet system, as they exposed the weaknesses of a centrally planned economy and allowed for greater political dissent. The fall of the Berlin Wall led to a rapid dissolution of the Eastern Bloc and the Warsaw Pact, and in 1991 a failed coup against Gorbachev signalled the end of the Soviet Union. By December of that year, the USSR was officially dissolved and the Russian Federation emerged as the successor state. And this all, from the outside at the very least, looked like a fantastic idea. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, democracy and capitalism, those ideals and ideologies that us in the West hold so dear started to emerge in Russia itself. And Russia moved further towards democracy and capitalism under President Boris Yeltsin. The 1990s were marked by economic hardships and political chaos though, as Russia struggled to transition from a centrally planned economy to a market-based one, and the rapid privatization of state-owned enterprises led to the rise of powerful oligarchs who amassed enormous wealth while the majority of the population faced economic uncertainty. One of the key reasons why democracy and capitalism was seen as a failure in Russia during this period was that Boris Yeltsin introduced something called the voucher system. And the idea behind this was a solid one. The idea was like our public markets to allow the public to buy shares or vouchers in various enterprises that were previously state owned. The problem is without strict regulation and with the amount of corruption, this led to a small amount of individuals buying these vouchers and taking over these very lucrative enterprises such as oil and natural gas and led us to the oligarchs we saw rise over the course of that 20 to 30 year period. And this period remains a defining chapter in Russia's post-Soviet history with lasting implications for its political and economic development. It was in this context that Vladimir Putin was able to grab control of the nation. As a former KGB officer, Vladimir Putin was adept at manipulating the system and figuring out a way to grab power. And he rose to power initially serving as prime minister under Yeltsin and eventually became the president in 1999. But Putin then consolidated power and stabilized the Russian economy, but at the expense of civil liberties and democratic norms. Under his rule, Russia saw a crackdown on independent media, the centralization of political power, and the suppression of opposition voices. Putin had a very different vision for Russia. Putin's vision for Russia included a return to its former glory. This entailed re-establishing Russia's influence in its near abroad as seen in the Russia-Georgia War of 2008 and the annexation of Crimea in 2014. These actions were driven by a desire to protect Russian-speaking populations and to maintain control over strategically important territories. Domestically, Putin pursued policies that harkened back to the Soviet era, cracking down on dissent, controlling the media and promoting nationalism. His government has been accused of human rights abuses and fostering an atmosphere of fear and repression. But despite these issues, Putin has maintained high approval ratings in the state, if they can be believed. And this is largely due to his strongman image as a former KGB operative and a man who is willing to take on the big powers in the West. But more importantly to a lot of the Russian people, the fact that he had reignited Russia's place on international politics and its place on the standings of the world superpowers. The Soviet Union will be pleased to offer amnesty to your wayward vessel. The Soviet Union? I thought you guys broke up. Yes, that's what we wanted you to think. The crisis in Ukraine now, though, can be seen as a culmination of not only Putin's ambitions, but also the West's fears and the Russian fears of what the West was trying to do. Russia had long warned the US and EU against allowing Ukraine to join NATO, viewing it as a direct threat to Russian security. 
In 2014, pro-Russian Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych was ousted after widespread protests, leading to Russia's annexation of Crimea and the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. In a way, all of this goes back to 1991. Because when the Soviet Union fell, NATO started expanding eastward into what was formerly Russian territory. In 1994, Ukraine joined the NATO Partnership for Peace program, and this was the start of cooperation between Ukraine and NATO. But it was in 1999 when the likes of Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary started to join NATO that tensions, particularly for Putin and his most ardent supporters, began to rise. And this was exacerbated in 2002 by seven more Eastern European countries joining, but it came to a head in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit, when NATO expressed that it was willing to allow Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO. And up until this point and in the years leading to it, Russia had consistently warned NATO and the US about continuing their eastward expansion. And it seems like for Russia, this is the point where things began to escalate. In a way, we could look at this similar to the timelines after World War II. But instead, this time we have to look at it flipped. In 1947, the Iron Curtain speech was famously Winston Churchill warning about the rise of the Soviet Union. Whereas this time in 2008, it was Russia warning about NATO pushing forward. It seems though in 2008 that Russia was adamant to prove that it wasn't just giving false warnings. And when NATO decided to express support for Georgia to join its alliance, the Russia-Georgia war kicked into full gear. And this for me is realistically, if we were to go back through a timeline where this new Cold War actually started. Because since then, tensions have only escalated, while slowly but surely the political alliances between Russia and the rest of the West have fallen apart as Russia aligned itself more with the likes of China. And in 2022, for me, the Cold War was officially in full swing, and that was the symbolic start of the escalation, like the 1950s, if you will, where we fully entered a Cold War state as Russia decided to invade the Ukraine completely. Because this is one step further than a proxy war. This is an escalation of claiming territory, but at the same time warning those in the West that if you do any more than just work with Ukraine in terms of proxy support, like Vietnam and like Korea, we will fully be at war. And nuclear threats have been offered. All of this culminates in the fact that we are very much in a Cold War, and one with even further tensions given that Russia is actually on the ground fighting in Ukraine than the previous one. The peaceful state that we have all enjoyed for 30 plus years now has come to an end and bigger tensions could rise very soon, especially with China eyeing up Taiwan. Subscribe.